Everyday Juggler, your source for juggling highlights, interviews, tutorials, and reviews. And now your host, Sean Livingston. Hey everybody, and thanks for tuning in to this edition of Everyday Juggler Profiles. Today we get to hang out with Reese Thomas. He's been juggling for many, many years. He's been performing for over 27 years. He's kind of major niche is performing at schools and museums for like teaching science to kids which I just think is so awesome and a big reason why I wanted to have him on here and uh, thanks so much for being on and I was wondering if you could fill in any gaps about who you are and uh, also tell us what you're most excited about in your juggling life right now all right well uh, I'm a homo sapiens on the planet earth I juggle and um, it's been a wonderful challenge for 30 some odd years and the newest challenge for me has been um, poi juggling, actually juggling three poi, which is uh, remarkably difficult, either <laughs> because I'm getting older or because it's actually pretty hard. So you've got like a contact juggling ball and then a rope mm -hmm. and then a smaller knob ball at the end. The whole thing's like 28 inches roughly. And so you're throwing something that's floppy. Mm -hmm. You know, unless there's there's a centrifugal thing going on here, it just wants to be floppy. And what's weird is that you focus so much on the bottom of the pattern because you have to swing back enough to throw it with spin. Okay. And it becomes this weird, very different from other juggling that I've done. You just you're focusing on the bottom of the pattern. So when you're throwing the the ball up, you're you're wanting the the rope or string to stay taut and kind mm -hmm. of like you know yeah and so it flips like a club mm -hmm. you know right but then when you catch it it drapes and and you can catch the middle of the rope and slide to the knob and one of the things like, i had so much trouble trying to learn it <clears throat> and i was just thinking oh, i'm just getting old i'm just in, incapable of learning anymore mm -hmm. what is going on here and then i shortened it one inch oh interesting and i and i tripled the number of catches i was getting huh. It was just like that precise a difference. And right. Like, what? That's a really interesting combination of kind of juggling with flow art stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I like and that. And then what I want to get is to doing like the, um, what would be the, the five, two, three, you know, kind of patterns so that you can swing one around while you dwell on the other side and mm -hmm. then switch sides so you can get big arcs going while throwing. Mm-hmm. You know, It'll be fun. That'll be awesome. So uh, you've been juggling for how many years? Well, I was going to do the math, but I'm on a day off, so I won't. Hear. But <laughs> I learned to juggle when I was 16. I'll be 53 next month. So you do the math. In 30 some odd years. You know. All right. And uh, what kind of uh, – why did you get started? What, what pushed uh, you to start learning to juggle? I got a pat answer for that. I learned to juggle to impress a girl – and then I lost the girl and juggled to forget. Oh, wow. The concept was that my friend was learning to juggle, and he had a cute sister. And I thought, if I'm hanging out at his house learning to juggle, I'm hanging out at her house. Mm -hmm. And it worked great. And it worked I learned great. to juggle. Yeah, I learned to juggle, lost my virginity. It was a great summer. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but then she broke up with you. Oh, no, sort of. We drifted apart here. It was Really more my fault, but... Wait, she wasn't hanging out at your friend's house anymore, so it was okay? Well, I lived 27 miles outside of, of a decent-sized city, which wasn't even that big, Eugene, Oregon. And so, it's like, I never got into town. It was a 27-mile bike ride. My mm -hmm. dad had the only car, you know? So, I stayed home and juggled. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you were 16, and mm -hmm. uh, what kept you going? I, I really enjoyed it. I never gelled with the um team sports didn't do particularly well at them and uh again the whole difficulty of getting back and forth from places living way out in the woods um it was a it was a game of catch that i could play with someone who was always there myself <laughs> <laughs> plus people thought it was weird and i liked being weird so okay. i would listen i would listen to like the b-52s out in an area where only country was listened to and work on ball bounce juggling and people would kind of walk around me like he's different <laughs> and you liked that <laughs> i did like that yeah um and uh so you did you go to college i did i have a bs in journalism which is the appropriate degree for journalism i think uh, for juggling 
journalism. Okay. And how, how has that affected your, your juggling career, having a degree in journalism? <laughs> well, you know, I learned to write. And mm-hmm. I learned to write about a whole lot of different things. And I like to riff on a whole lot of different things. And I like to write. And so I guess it, it gave, me a, gave me a breadth of knowledge and an ability to communicate with the written word, which is close to the spoken word. So those mm-hmm. all helped. Mm-hmm. And I've written a couple of books on juggling that have made me tens of dollars. <laughs> what, what, what are those books? Let's, let's see if we can get a few more tens in there. <laughs> well, I wrote the Meteor book, which was the first book on swinging meteors, which are like conjoined poi. And uh, I wrote the ball spinning book. Ooh, the ball spinning book, mm-hmm. which is good enough that people in Japan actually translated it. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I thought. And actually, I wrote this book, and I cannot read it. <laughs> <laughs> but it sells a lot better in Japan than it does here. <laughs> you know, I sort of wonder when you see like English translations of of like Chinese, like how off they are. Hmm. Yeah, um, I've wondered about that. I've asked <laughs> I've asked Japanese friends to like just look at a few parts, and it's like, does this? What does this say? And they're kind of translate it back. I'm going. Okay, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. Um, So, you know, you just showed us a a couple, a couple of books that you wrote. Uh, How did you, how did you get into Meteor? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was asked to do torch juggling at some big civic event, and I felt like, you know. You can drop a torch. They never give you enough room. It's always kind of worrisome. I want something that I can swing around. And I'd done a lot of club swinging because that was fairly popular back in the, you know, (laughs) mid 80s and whatnot. And uh, I thought, is there anything similar? And I had an old book on fire breathing that had a section on swinging these pans of fire. And so I went back and looked at that. And uh, the guy, it was Bruno Nolo was his name. He was a bodybuilder who did this big fire spinning thing. And um, I looked at that. I learned every trick in that. Did a couple of rock concerts and stuff. And <laughs> was like, this is great. I can do a big fire effect that's bigger than most torch juggling. And I don't have to let go. So I felt much safer about mm. doing it among all their equipment and such. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got into that. Any, any notable rock shows? Not really, you know, local groups, um, open for Bobby McFerrin, open for Weird Al. All right. I think of anybody else that people would know the names of. Used to, used to show for the Grateful Dead. That was fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's funny. Cause I was about to say, uh, when I talked to David Kane, he, he's open for the Grateful Dead. So <laughs> see, we're both getting older and older. <laughs> But I can one up him, you know the uh, the skull with the lightning bolt logo of the Grateful Dead. Uh, no, I don't know it. But... Oh, you see, you're younger than we are, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> it's like it's an it's an internationally recognized logo, and my father painted that. So. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I had some ends on that. Mm-hmm. Is that why you were the chauffeur? Because I knew your dad. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So then the the other thing, ball spinning. Um, that's just something you found that you were particularly good at and could teach people? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was good enough. And um, I, I realized that a lot of people didn't do ball spinning. And ball spinning is wonderful to add to juggling. It's like if you can juggle, it's like, oh, well, that's not enough of a finale. It's got to be, well, like knives or something. Oh, now we're getting close to a finale. Oh, on a roll of bola. There we go. That's pretty good. It's like, but if you could get that third thing in there, wow, that would be a finale. So I worked on the ball spinning mostly to place it on a mouth stick so that I could do a ball spin, a juggle, and a balance at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, uh... That worked great. That got a good response. Mm -hmm. And then from there, learning to do curls and learning to do a backward roll and all that kind of stuff. You know, really, I feel like on most of my skills, I am a mid-level decent juggler. I'm not a great juggler at really anything, but I'm pretty good at a lot of things. And then you combine with that the comedy and a friend of mine, the Reverend Chumley, who was a great comedian, vaudevillian, 
He said, two mediocrities make an act. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always kind of lived by that, you know. That's good. All right, so that the boss spinning book got translated into Japanese. What what's the story behind that? Well, you know, I went to uh, Shizuoka for the Daido Gay Street Performer Festival. They had scouted me in um, Edmonton, Alberta, where I was performing at a, a street performer festival. And they were like, come to Japan. You're the only American act. You can be the best American act this year, <laughs> even if you flop. I'm like, wow, I can't turn that down. <laughs> and uh, while I was there, somebody came up and, and said, you know, I really like your ball spinning. And would it be possible to get you to write about ball spinning. And I said, well, I already have a book on ball spinning. And they're like, what? You know, we can just translate it. And it went from there. And uh, so my meteor book and my ball spinning book, both are translated into Japanese, which I just was really tickled by. Mm -hmm. That's really great. So uh, I want to talk more about kind of your time abroad. But before we do that, I want to get back to kind of back to your college days. So you're, you're doing journalism. Um, did you continue juggling through college or did you just kind of? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I found that I could actually street perform and make book money or beer money, depending on what day of the week it was, you know. But I uh, <laughs> started working in festivals and, uh, you know, just little civic things and whatnot. And the famous Oregon Country Fair, which you've probably never heard of, but it's an enormous hippie fair out here in uh, Eugene area, Eugene, Oregon. People come from all over to see it. And, uh, I had some buddies that I juggled with and we would do like sitting on each other's shoulders, three high juggling and then doing totem pole impressions while we're sitting on each other's shoulders That's and awesome. singing, singing three part harmonies. And it was really fun Do backflips and some other acrobatic stuff. And then after a while, they kind of wanted to go another direction and uh, they became a different troupe and I became successful. <laughs> All right. Well, that works out. So yeah. you had this degree in journalism, but did were you, when did you realize, uh, I think I want to be a juggler full time? Well, I also had a teaching certificate for language arts, secondary ed, and uh, I became a middle school English teacher immediately following college. And I taught for one year and decided I'd rather juggle knives. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just like so much work. Teaching was so much work. And uh, I finished teaching. They wanted me back. And I thought, no, I'm going to say no to that. And I'm going to move to Seattle. And I'm going to become a street performer. And I did. And never looked back. Mm -hmm. Although I still teach a little bit, not English, but I teach juggling and stuff. You know? Right. Um, were you married at that point? Not quite. Okay. Yeah. Got married soon after that. Been married for almost, like, pretty much those... 27 years. It's... Mm -hmm. So you took your, did you take your soon to be wife to the, to the streets to juggle with you? You know, she, she wasn't greatly interested in performing. She did juggle mm -hmm. and uh, she still juggles. Actually, she's become quite good at club passing and she's very involved with the um, Portland juggling festival and throwing that big party every year. That's great. Yeah. But uh, no, she was a secretary for a, about a year helping out in a law office. And then from then on out, it was like, we lived entirely off of my juggling, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you're, and you're still keeping that up. Actually, she's been working part time lately just for fun, just to have some difference. Our girls are getting older. They're high school and college age and she wanted some change. And, mm -hmm. and so she's been doing other stuff. Right. So, uh, did you, were you ever part of like juggling clubs as you were, uh, in your we had, life? Well, we had a loose juggling club in Eugene. And um, then, of course, the Portland jugglers, the no problem, easy pickup Portland jugglers. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved with them for 25 years, 20 some years. I mean, a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we throw the Portland Juggling Festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your uh, kind of connection with that club and throwing the Portland Festival, it, it sounds like, um, have played a big part in helping you continue to, I don't know, love juggling? I have no doubt about that. Yeah, definitely. Every year I get to be inspired by the people that come and visit and perform. And we've had so many people. 
so many good performers. And, you know, like from that, you know, like, oh, just hanging out with Victor Key. You know, I'm feeling like I'm having a good time with this juggling. I'm meeting some neat people and uh, friends with, from the Cirque du Soleil. And then you get to go drop in and they say, oh, just come backstage and hang out. And you feel important and you feel cool. And, and then you go and you take a workshop and you learn something and entirely different about something you've been doing for decades and you go what is this juggling it is it, it can feed you for as long as you're willing to do it you know it's mm-hmm. pretty pretty great it's really awesome and then i myself took on the challenge of performing in the renegade show and the public show every year of the portland juggling festival and doing something different for as long as i could and for over 20 years i did two different sets at each festival and tried some wacky stuff and uh, tried some very difficult stuff. And, and I always succeeded. It was pretty great. That's awesome. Still, still trot out new stuff for that. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gives you something to work towards. That's maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you succeed in something and you get the uh, pats on the back that jugglers are quite good at giving, mm-hmm. it does inspire you to continue. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as I, I mentioned in the intro, you do a lot of schools and, and museums for science stuff. Um, mm-hmm. How did that get started? Well, the timeline is, uh, is pretty simple there. So, I taught, and then I decided to become a street performer. So, I moved to Seattle, and I became a street performer. And then the summer ended, and it started raining and sleeting. And I'm out on the street going, this isn't going to work for the winter. And uh, I went to the Pacific Science Center, and there was a guy there that was doing a show that was a science juggling circus show, and his skills were really mediocre, and his science was super basic, Hmm. and I thought, I could do this and do it better. Mm -hmm. And I went to the people there that were in charge in the main offices, and I told them that. I said, I think I can do what he does, and I can do it better. And they were like, well, we're pretty happy with him. And I said... Next Saturday, right in front of the Science Museum, I'm going to do a street show, and it's going to be science-based circus tricks. And they were like, okay, cool. I said, you walk out at noon. Mm -hmm. And they walked out at noon, and I had a bigger crowd than they had in their museum, and I was succeeding at that. And they were like, yeah, you know, if you'd like to perform here once a month, we will hire you for a weekend every month. And that got me through that first winter. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's pretty successful. <laughs> and then uh, after that, I realized that I could bring them to schools, and I marketed it to museums, and I've been to I think seven different countries performing my science circus. Mm-hmm. So when that first that first time you did it, um, when you told them you were going to be out in a week doing a show, had you ever thought about how like what kind of acts you would do that related to science or do you have to basically write something that week i worked so hard that week i mean i just oh day in day out ground away at it but i've always looked at my juggling from a sort of a physics standpoint looking at the gyroscopics of ball spinning and um early pre-site swap mapping out the relative heights and, and time aloft of thrown balls and whatnot trying to figure out a language for that i've got these like cryptic notebooks trying to create a, a choreography language for juggling that's so funny that it never worked really it was <laughs> a good exercise but then when sight swap came out it was like hallelujah that's so clear and useful were you like why didn't uh, i think of that <laughs> oh yeah it's just beautiful yeah that's what i've been trying to say yep um yeah. so basically i had already thought with a sort of scientific mind about juggling. So it wasn't that hard to figure it out. And mm-hmm. the physics is not difficult. I am not a physicist, never took physics, always wished I could, you know, but it really, it wasn't offered in my high school. Mm-hmm. It wasn't my interest in college. My interest was more languages and writing. Mm-hmm. You know. What What are like a couple examples of a simple lesson you would might teach during one of your performances? Okay, so uh, gyroscopic stability and just talk about how what a strange thing that sometimes an object can be more stable spinning than standing still. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps I'll throw a top or do ball spinning. Um, I like to talk about centripetal force 
And when you throw something outward, if it is pushed back or pulled back by something else, that is a centripetal force, Mm -hmm. which is really useful if you want to do cowboy lariat tricks. That's Mm -hmm. all centripetal force and outward motion. Mm -hmm. Of course, gravity. And the wonderful thing about gravity is that it pulls things of different mass at the same rate of acceleration. So we can juggle a ping pong ball and a bowling ball and a regular juggling ball in the same rhythm as three balls that weigh the same amount, even though they're falling the same distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's fun. I think I haven't really ever thought about juggling in this way, so I think it's ah. yeah, that's good. I've been putting out some little videos I just finished up that I got to start getting out there that are like three-minute lessons on inertia using circus tricks or three-minute lessons on balance, you know, things like that. Okay, that's cool. Um, and then you also, uh, that's just part of what you do. You also perform, you know, wherever. <laughs> I noticed yeah, that I've done, you've done a lot of, it looks like you do a lot of like corporate events. I do corporate events. I do cruise ships. I do lots of festivals. I do theaters, like full 90-minute theater shows. And uh, I'm just a juggalo, you know. <laughs> so, all right, I'm I'm, not, I'm gonna leave that. So, um, <laughs> uh, w- when you're writing like a script for something that's gonna be towards kids or that's or something that's for adults, kind of what's your mindset as you're thinking through jokes to to tell? Do I think it's funny? Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's that's the biggie, and. Uh, it was so nice in the old days when I did more street performing where you could just try something. And if it didn't work, then change it or throw it away, mm-hmm. you know? And if it did work, then keep it. You know? And nowadays there's much more, it's kind of got to work. You know, somebody's paying you hundreds of dollars to come out and do a little show and you're like, uh, blah, blah, blah. And everybody <laughs> looks at you blankly and you're like, okay, no Dostoevsky jokes today. <laughs> you know, but, but like, Last night, I was performing at a country club for a a Christmas tree lighting celebration. And I tried a a trick that I've only done a couple of times before. And uh, it was actually pretty funny because it sort of didn't work. But I got some good input from what the kids enjoyed about it and what the adults enjoyed about it. In the trick, I juggle five juggling balls, each of them a different color. And I have a kid with a cube that has six different colors, one on each side. And they put it in a cup and they shake it up and they look in and they see what they've shook. And I drop the ball that is the color that they rolled, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, I've been trying to figure out how to present that because I could go, was this your color? And throw them the yellow ball, for instance, if yellow is what I perceive that they they rolled. But instead, I've been dropping the ball that they rolled. Now, I can't see what they rolled. It's Mm -hmm. a mind reading, mind reading trick. So it's combining mentalism with juggling. And uh, so the other day I did it. And it was mostly adults and they totally got that I was guessing correctly with my drop, Mm -hmm. right? This yesterday, a lot more kids, they perceived that as a failure. Oh, you dropped it. Mm. It's like, yeah, but I figured out what color (laughs) they were talking about. And they're like, yeah, but you dropped. Mm-hmm. To them, it's like they couldn't make that connection, you know. Right. So that's one. Is like, okay, I'll work on that one. You know. Like, that's really interesting. So, yeah, you got to tweak things. Mm-hmm. Scotty Meltzer, though, Scotty Meltzer said that uh, you have to have different comedy for different audiences, unless you're Reese Thomas, <laughs> which I thought was incredibly flattering. But <laughs> but it really is true that most of the time it's. Whether it's a corporate event or a library show, the vast majority of my material is the same material. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're, you, you, just have, you must just have one of those personalities that people can connect with. I think so. Yeah. And, and a lot of it, I, for any, I don't know why anybody would want to listen to an interview with me, but for anybody out there that's trying to become a successful juggler and whatnot, so much of it is getting across that you're enjoying it, that Mm -hmm. you're having fun, that you find this interplay funny and things, tricks are challenging. You know, a lot of people come up and they go, you really look like you're enjoying yourself. And I think I'm so glad it comes across that way (laughs) because for the most part I am, but there are those shows sometimes where you're just going, this is like pulling teeth. This is so much work. 
Mm-hmm. But then somebody comes up and goes, you look like you're having so much fun. Like, oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I faked it. Yeah. Speaking of appealing to different audiences and some liking and some not, how is it performing in other countries? Have you noticed a difference in how you have to present? Well, certainly my verbal humor gets curtailed. Um, like when I was working in Abu Dhabi, I was had a translator and... In Japan, same thing. Uh, in Japan, mostly I worked to music, but um, many places I'll, I'll get a translator and I'll, I'll run over the show with them and we'll try to figure out what's going to work. Hmm. Although in Abu Dhabi, it was really funny because the younger people had enough English, they would be laughing, and then the translator would say the translation and there'd be this pause of nothing. <sighs> <laughs> and so like the older people just didn't think it was funny and the younger people was like we already heard it <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah it's strange it was a strange dynamic you know but mostly like in japan i w- would work to music but i would try to write the occasional joke like my paddle ball i called it oishiri pempem baru which basically means spanking ball mm. and that would get a ho 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 no, it, was, it was good. It's fun to try to write a joke in another language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like totally different cultural humor. It's like, how do you. I well, feel... like in little idiomatic phrases and stuff, you don't mm-hmm. realize that that's just a colloquialism of your language or your region. And you'll throw it out there and people look at you like, we don't say that. Mm-hmm. You know? Have you ever performed in England? No. Okay. I've been to England, but I, I didn't really perform there. Okay. I've just I've read that they're they're a hard audience, so I was wondering if you'd Well when I was in Denmark at um the European the UJC, um there were a lot of Brits there and a lot of UK people. And what I remember most was I, I did this routine where I'm juggling two juggling balls and a meat cleaver and I'm cutting celery held in the mouth of the volunteer and um I said something about, well, in America, when we do that, and it's like, boom, microphone turned off. Lights dimmed out. Lights came back on. <laughs> and I was like, did I say America? Boom, lights off. What? My, microphone <laughs> off. They're just like, you cannot reference America in a renegade show, apparently, <laughs> at that time. <laughs> you know. Excuse and, me. Uh, yeah. And it was pretty funny. I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> So was there any juggler you looked up to as you kind of were in your, I mean, we can, we can say in the beginning and then as you were kind of Mm -hmm. developing in your career. Uh, I had a lot of interaction with the flying Karamazov brothers. And so to see juggling and speaking simultaneously and speaking about pseudo intellectual fun stuff, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't like, I'm going to throw it high. It was, you know, I don't know. I can't think of an example or whatever, but it would, it would be, you know, a higher level of, of comedy combined with good juggling. And I certainly imprinted on that early on. Mm-hmm. And um, there's another fellow, Roberto Morganti, who was kind of the opposite. He was entirely silent, but very graceful. And he took me under his wing and taught me just a lot of, you know, club passing and a lot about um, just the the framing of juggling. You know, what it's you know, don't just do it because it looks, you know, because it feels good. Figure out how to make it look good as well. And and you see that. I mean, there are some people that juggle and they just look gawky. Yes, they're pulling it off, but mm-hmm. they look gawky. You know. Mm-hmm. And then you have somebody like Victor Key, who's like his lines are just so clean. You know. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun. Um, Popovich, Gregory Popovich. Saw some video of him early on, and uh, that it just blew me away. Just the things that he was, was doing were so impossible to me at that time to mm-hmm. even think that anybody could do this stuff. You know? And these were like these were this was film. This wasn't even video. This was film. Okay. Because there was there was a guy who was a. Um, he was in Eugene, and he was he was uh, Tom Dewart. Uh, he was a very good juggler, and he had enough money and access to I don't know how he got it, but he would do little film nights and actually show old juggling reels, 
And uh, that was really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, you just open up your phone and look at anybody. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> even, but, uh, even the old stuff that was on film. Yeah. But like Popovich, he'd do the freestanding ladder. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to learn freestanding ladder. And mm-hmm. I was on tour with a small circus that was going through the U.S. And there was a guy that, um, Oresto Dubiki, and he would do the freestanding ladder. And he knew Popovich and, and he had defected from the Soviet Union, you know. And, and so I, I learned freestanding ladder from him. That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty fun. And uh, dangerous. I mean, I, those were my worst injuries were freestanding ladder. But, mm-hmm. uh, and you still do I, it. I don't actually. That's oh, one that okay. I I cut out as I've gotten older. I was like, you know what? I don't want to crash anymore. You know. Uh, I think I I think on your website you you have what you you want your epitaph to be or what what you want your tombstone to say. What it sounds like maybe a ladder would be good for that. What was? You... <laughs> I, I always said I wanted it to say Reese Thomas juggler. He finally dropped. <laughs> <laughs> so you almost need the ladder for that one. <laughs> yeah, I I crashed once on the ladder and I ended up getting seven stitches in my forehead. That was and the funny thing was I had a photo shoot the next day. Oh. And so I like calling up the photographer and going, "Yeah, I think we're gonna have to postpone this." And he said, "Oh, I can touch it up." I'm like, "No, no, you can't." You know, it was like big swollen black eye. You know, <laughs> that's pretty great. But I've always liked combining balancing. So like I do slack rope freestanding ladder of course roll a bola i can do the roller bola with two active rollers you know with so it looks like three because there's a mm-hmm. space roller and uh stilts of course you know just all of those different balancing toys because i always enjoyed that mm-hmm. it's fun it's fun when you're balancing acrobatically and juggling how much peripheral awareness you need mm. you know because you're referencing a point to balance but you're also having to see all the juggling and I feel very alive when I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So would you say that's kind of one of your more favorite things to do when you're performing is balance and juggle? Yeah. Simultaneously. Um, What's your, uh, do you have any tips for us on how we can get better at doing that ourselves? (laughs) I'm a terrible teacher. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That's why you quit, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it really is about it's it, it's it's like a Zen Cohen peripheral focus, right? So it's like peripheral, but you need to focus, and there is this nice feeling in your brain. There's a there's a click kind of that when you are going, oh, now I am aware of all these different th- things I'm doing. So say you're you're bouncing on a slack rope, spinning a ring on your leg, spinning a ball on a mouth stick, and juggling, all right? That's a lot of stuff going on at once. Mm-hmm. But you really, when it clicks, it's it feels like one thing. It is a thing. Hmm. Each part gets started, and then it becomes a thing. And so I would say, if you want to work on that sort of stuff, try to find that peripheral focus. Hmm. It's just practice. It's all practice. I don't think I do much of anything that pretty nearly anybody with a reasonably capable body couldn't do. Mm-hmm. You know, I always said I'm not gifted. I'm dogged. Okay, so you're you're persistent and you keep at it. Yeah. So so I mean, just thinking about kind of the peripheral focus. Um, I guess when you're first starting, it's it's really about kind of figuring out one by one. So say you, you've got a ball spinning in your finger and then or on a mouse stick and then you're juggling, like focusing on getting that done before you add a ring to your leg. Oh, yeah. Um, and taking it yeah, one I, by one. And then do you kind of do it in different orders, too? Like, all right, I can. Yeah. OK. It actually can make a difference if you try to do it in a different order. Sometimes it's like, ah, oh, I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. It's like. I will spin the ring before I spin the ball Mm -hmm. because if I spin the ball and put it on the mouth stick and then do the big motion of kicking the ring into spin, I'll bounce the ball off. Mm -hmm. But once I have the ring spinning, it becomes a small motion Mm -hmm. and it doesn't throw my head around as much. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, What would you say sets your performances apart? I'm the one who gets paid for them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) I can't think of anybody else who could perform and I'd get paid. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I've had 
just going by what other people have said, I've had a lot of people say that I'm kind of the intellectual juggler. And I don't think I'm the intellectual juggler. Um, but I do think that I enjoy riffing on a broader range of things, perhaps, than a lot of other people. Um, I like to think of it as reaching for the highest common denominator that you share with the audience rather than the lowest common denominator. A lot of performers, they try to figure out what's the lowest common denominator. Um, and they do things like, you know, clapping and whistling and getting the audience to respond, forcing them to respond by simply saying respond. Whereas I've always felt like I'm going to do what I do. And if you want to respond, I would enjoy hearing it, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask for it as much. You know? mm -hmm. Or you're not going to tell them what to do as much. Yeah. I always, I always dislike it when it's like, okay, I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I say instead, for instance, um, I'm going to do the paddle ball. Problem is nobody ever claps for paddle ball. Then they clap. Because they're like, oh, that's right. We didn't clap. And you are doing paddle ball. And you're like, no, I say you're too late. And I <laughs> shut them down right away. I just shut them down, you know. And then I'm like, um, all right, tell you what, I'm going to do paddle ball and juggle. And the funny thing is that when I do that, I get just as much applause as just doing paddle ball. And usually the audience is like, oh, you're right. We still aren't clapping, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so I am making them respond. But I'm not demanding it of them. I'm not saying mm -hmm. do it. You mm -hmm. know? You're almost you're almost leading them to mm -hmm. understand what you're doing as opposed to telling them what to see. Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. I don't know how to explain I, I it. Like, but. Well, that is, that's pretty clear. I am leading them. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And it is funny. Sometimes you do paddle ball and somebody just starts clapping and you're like, dang it. <laughs> you just ruined my joke. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to change it. You're like, well, you know, most people don't clap. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, you have to come up with... Some joke when only one person laughs. I guess you could say it must not be that impressive if only one person clapping. Or yeah. Something. All right. So, uh, out of all out of all of years of performing, what one performance sticks out? Gee. Or that or another kind of challenge. version of that question is: Is there one performance that was kind of like a a moment in your life, like a defining moment in your life? Wow. It's been so much fun. I've been so many great moments. Um, trying to, think, I mean, like one of the first things is that comes out. Well, the first thing that popped into my head was walking into the official press conference for the Dido Gay Street Performer Festival, and it was like paparazzi. You know, you're walking along, it's all like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and that I just couldn't believe that. I was just going, "What am I doing here? I'm just a juggler from Crow, Oregon. Nobody knows that place in the whole world, and there's like all this focus on me." You know, I was like, "That was cool." Um, but that wasn't really a performance. But then, then the second was uh, doing an NBA halftime, hmm. and uh, that was terrifying. I Absolutely bet. terrifying. So that just stuck into my head. Is there like 10,000 people surrounding you and I'm going to go out and juggle on a freestanding ladder. And, and really what it boiled down to was 10,000 people ignoring you and I'm going to be in the middle of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't care. You know, I was like, oh, some juggler, you know. Right. And, uh, and so it's that was like, a big space, right? Like, Oh, yeah. You're this little guy. And the best part, though, was walking off as the players are coming on uh, okay. and it's like they're as big as my ladder <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny i've had so many moments where i'm like i'm in a theater and literally hundreds of people are just praising you with their attention and their applause and you just feel absolutely unworthy and at the same time proud that you earned it you know mm -hmm. and that's happened many times mm -hmm. you know that's great uh how have you seen this life of yours full of juggling how have you seen that have a positive effect on your life well i certainly have gotten to travel more than i think i would have as a middle school teacher you know mm -hmm. maybe i would have saved up and gone to see a few things but i've seen a lot of things and uh, 30 different countries by last count. That's pretty, pretty fun. Um, it has 
allowed me to spend a lot of time with some very unique individuals. And I absolutely am loving that. Street performer festivals are filled with just wacky, wonderful people. Mm-hmm. Um, I start running into old classmates and they're getting pot bellies and whatnot. And I weigh what I wrestled at in eighth grade, you know, so that's kind of nice. That's great. <laughs> Keeps you in good shape. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I've been able to give, uh, real breadth of experience to my daughters and share a lot of wonderful things with my wife and uh, you know to get to say uh, what do you want to do for our anniversary and I got to say well why don't you meet me in Rome Mm -hmm. and then we'll take a cruise ship to Venice it's like okay that gets your point (laughs) as a a husband I'll tell you that yeah that's great (laughs) yeah so it's 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 been a lot of really positive time the worst part of it is stage fright I've had stage fright far more days than anybody should have stage fright in their life but you know you got to pay for it somehow right so you still get butterflies right before performance for some shows you Mm -hmm. know shows shows that matter shows um i mean to me like when it's for people that i know the, the portland juggling festival you know so many people have watched me for decades and they expect me to come out and do something really good you know, mm-hmm. it's like oh, okay whereas people that don't really know you you're just right. performing for strangers it's like oh cool and he was good you know but their expectations were kind of like who knows you, know? mm-hmm. you would think it would be and, easier with people that have seen you every year because like you're comfortable with them but, you would think so but not in this yeah. case <laughs> yeah and, well, and then uh, there's the Moisture Festival, which is a very large vaudeville festival in Seattle. And there again, you almost always are performing with and for people whose work you appreciate. And so you just that pressure of I've got to be good enough mm-hmm. to be worthy of their interest, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. And then a follow up question. How have you seen juggling, your juggling or juggling in general affect people's lives positively besides yours? Uh, the first thing that leaps into my head was um, I was working with Shoehorn, the tap dancing saxophonist, an incredible artist. And um, we were we, we did a show in Buell, Idaho, if I remember correctly, which is kind of nowhere. And this woman came up and said, um, I saw your poster a couple of weeks ago. And I actually live in Canada, but I came back to watch your show. And we were like, wow, that's neat. And she said, I came back because I have terminal cancer. Hmm. And that looked like something that would make me laugh. And I came back and I watched it and I really laughed. Thank you. And we were just like. (laughs) So apparently there are people in this world that really need to laugh. Mm -hmm. And um, I give a lot of them an opportunity to do that. Mm. And I, I do think that has some effect. That is such a great story. And and that's just the person that came and talked to you, which I think is yeah. kind of what you're getting at. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. All right. So uh, a, a few, several short questions uh, to kind of finish us off. What's your favorite trick or pattern to do? <laughs> My favorite trick or pattern to do. I really, I really like four four one. It's 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 not that hard, but it has such a different shape. Mm-hmm. I like that also. <laughs> um, how about to watch? To watch, wow. Um, favorite to watch, wow. Uh, I really like head rolls because I can't do them. But lately, I've been watching this uh, poi juggling. Like I said, I'm trying to learn that. And I don't do poi to speak of. I used to poo-poo poi. But (laughs) lately, um, it's just gotten so complex. But then watching a good three-poi juggler, it's pretty gorgeous stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be something that grows more and more in the next couple of years, too. Mm -hmm. What's the favorite festival you've been to? Well, the Portland Juggling Festival. <laughs> There's so many peak moments there. It's a teaching festival, and it's also a very party festival. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's truly a gas. Mm-hmm. Um, your favorite prop to use? Tennis balls and can really pleases me. <laughs> okay. 
Um, favorite brand of juggling props? Wow. Um, for Attitude Renegade, okay. I tend to juggle Todd Smith's. Okay. Um, favorite music to listen to while you're practicing? Broken Bells. It's Not a rock familiar. group. Oh, they're really good. Really good rock group. They're uh, really thoughtful lyrics, but a good danceable beat. And uh, it's a little disco influence because I have to date myself there, but I can find <laughs> that rhythm. All right. Great. And finally, for these questions, what's a couple of practicing tips? Actually, or, practice. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's, practicing that's a is a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I'm such a terrible practicer. <laughs> uh, well, there was a time when you practiced. You know, I think I'm a I think I'm a night person because it seems like when I practice at night, I go further, but I tend to get booked to do all these day shows. <laughs> so, but um, one thing that's really helped me a lot is Under Armour. Mm. The compression and the warmth, because mm -hmm. I'm a skinny guy, so I get cold relatively quickly. And uh, so it's nice to get actually warm up before you try that new stuff. And huh. it is really helpful to just, just juggle. I would say the best practicing tip I can think of is start juggling with no plan and keep juggling until it's fun, then work. Mm. Okay. That's good. And how do you find time to to practice. I have to actually schedule it. It mm -hmm. seems like, you know, I can easily spend all day doing uh, contracts and phone calls and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, unless I go, I am going to practice. I won't even get to it. You mm -hmm. know, I warm up a lot for shows, but I don't practice enough. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So if people want to see you connect you or connect with you or hire you, where can they do that? Mm -hmm. Jugglemania.com. Yeah, go there. If you're looking for a science show, sciencecircus.org. Mm -hmm. so that's the new one. Sciencecircus.biz is the old one. But uh, jugglemania.com gets you to all my work. Okay. So jugglemania.org. You can tell I've been a juggler for a long time because I got jugglemania.com, not .org, .com. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. And you have the last word. So what's some advice for the juggling community at large? Don't focus on just one area of juggling. Play in all the areas so that you can appreciate the other jugglers around you. Mm, that's great advice. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for being with us again. Well, thanks for doing this, Sean. I, it, it's a, quite an endeavor. You must, uh, you must really want to give back to juggling. I yeah, I do. That. And I'm having a lot of fun. Cool. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, don't forget to check out my weekly highlight reels. And if you go to my website, you can download that free PDF, 15 ways to take your juggling to the next level. All right. Until next time, keep on juggling. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, be sure to support the channel. Leave a comment, like, share, and subscribe.